Hi, friend, and welcome back to Marvelous Friends, your home for all things Marvel Cinematic Universe and beyond. I'm Rhett, and today I am finishing up my series of reviews on the X-Men animated series on season four and five. Let's get it started. Roll that credit. Now, this is going to be over both seasons because season five is so incredibly short. It's only six episodes on the platform. Um, that's a whole other thing. Not going to get into that right now. But, yeah, so I'm combining both of these, just going to talk about it all at once. Now, it is going to be a lot more episodes. There's a lot more content, which did kind of help make the list a little bit easier for me to review because I had more stuff to talk about. But at the same time, it made it a little bit tougher because there's more things to talk about. So I had to be a little bit more discerning when creating my favorites and least favorites for this season and a half, if you will. That being said, let's jump into it. As always with this series, I'm going to jump into a review of the seasons first. So here's what happened in season four on the Disney Plus order of viewing of X-Men the Animated Series. The season opens as we are introduced to Nightcrawler. Through his interactions with Wolverine, he kind of helps him learn of a way to center and deal with his past, which we're thrown right into in the next episode as we explore the kind of mental manipulation that Wolverine went through in his early days after the operation that gave him claws. We then jump back into our time travel shenanigans as Cable and Bishop both try to save Xavier from being killed by one of Master Mold's agents, if you will. Now, this of course is done by them both carefully saving Xavier that in a way that saves both of their futures in the best way possible. It gets very complicated. I'm not a big fan of these episodes. I'll talk about that in a minute. That being said, after this is all handled, we are seeing Morph come back to the team. He has been away with Myra as he's received some psychological help, and he believes he's ready to jump back in with the team. However, jumping back into a mission dealing with Master Mold and the Sentinels who killed him in the first place is a little bit too much for him, and he realizes he's not quite ready to join the team, and he heads off again on his own. We then jump back in with Myra as we learn about her son and her ex-husband, who she left Charles for, as they deal with the out-of-control Proteus in that two-story, two-episode story. What we then jump into is basically the back half of the season at this point, and we see that Magneto has set up a sanctuary for prosecuted mutants up in space on a asteroid space station. Now, this is going pretty well until one of his mutant followers kind of throws him a coup and takes control of the asteroid, launching Magneto back onto Earth and framing the X-Men on board for doing so. The rest of the team comes to the rescue and are able to fish out what is actually happening, and though this is a failed experiment, and Sanctuary is just not going to work out, and Magneto is unable to live on the station anymore due to the fact that he requires the Earth's magnetic charge to keep his powers and keep alive. We now finally see some consequences of all the time travel shenanigans we've been seeing throughout the series, as Apocalypse finds himself in the axis of time, a dimension outside of time and space itself where everything happens simultaneously, and he sees an opportunity here to destroy the universe and start anew in his image, rounding up a few of the other villains throughout the series to aid him, including Magneto, Sinister, and Mystique. Now, this all is going well, except for the fact that Bishop is also trapped here after our last time travel episode. And though Apocalypse is able to round up 12 of the most powerful psychics in the universe, including Xavier, Jean, a new introduced psychic Psylocke, and one of Lelandra's guard Oracle, as well as a few other psychic characters you might recognize in the background, Bishop is able to save them and, along with the psychic, stop Apocalypse once and for all, it seems, and trapping him in this other dimension. And they escape to the safety of our regular time and space, and Bishop is returned to his time. Now we are back into our random assortment of episodes moving forward. Forward. First, we celebrate Christmas with the Morlocks, and then the ex-boyfriend Cody of Rogue is back and working with aliens to recruit her and the rest of the X-Men into their colony of parasitic lizard insect 
aliens. They were kind of weird looking, not sure exactly what they were. Then Xavier must battle through his memories to take on the Shadow King once again, while Cyclops ventures to a small western town that's been taken over by a group of rogue mutants to save an old scientist friend of his. Omega Red is back and trying to take over a lost submarine full of nuclear warheads. And finally, we follow Storm as she's lured to a distant planet who's suffering from some bizarre weather conditions. She's able to save the planet and then learns that the king who she is betrothed to now is actually evil and she must save the people from their tyranny. Season 5 is easy enough as it's only six episodes, but they are a random assortment of episodes. Why it's so short and all of that, I talk about a little bit potentially as a theory to that in my video up here in the card. If you haven't already watched it, check it out. It's regarding the proper viewing order of the series. Anyways, the first episode is a fantasy retelling of an X-Men mission, thanks to Jubilee's imagination. We follow the fifth horseman as Apocalypse tries to make his return via a second temple in South America. We learn of some historic times when Wolverine teamed up with Captain America to take on the Red Skull, and we also learn the origins of Mr. Sinister. Coming back to present day, the X-Men must save a young mutant who is being targeted by a mysterious and shady government agency. And finally, the X-Men say goodbye as the team says farewell to Xavier. That being said, that is what happens in Season 4 in the short Season 5 on Disney+. Plus. So let's jump into the actual review here. As always, I will be starting off with my five least favorite aspects of the season. Number five, Season 4 and 5 Split. It just doesn't make logical sense why they did this. Again, this gets into the whole rearranging of the series and all of that, but it just doesn't really seem that it was worthwhile for them to even make it a season five since they've already lengthened season four to such a huge degree. They should have just went ahead and tacked those six episodes onto it as well. There's no use separating it out like that or go ahead and go with the originally aired season four and season five lengths. It just seems bizarre that Disney Plus felt the need to do it this way. But again, that's a whole nother video. Number four, the Christmas special. The storyline of the episode is pretty good and a necessary one. We needed to see Storm return as the leader of the Morlocks that she became early on in the series in season one. However, I really don't think the need to make this so centrally focused around the idea that it's Christmas is necessary. And it just seemed like kind of a veiled attempt at a Christmas special. I know Christmas or holiday in general specials are very popular with shows, especially when they have episodes that are airing around a particular holiday. They just had never done one before, and this one seemed kind of silly and unnecessary. It also introduced some ideas, the fact that Jubilee is so familiar with so many of the Morlocks, but really and truly they haven't dealt with each other in a very long time. And I just, I don't know. I think the theming of it wasn't necessary. It was a necessary episode, but I did not like the forced holiday special aspect to the story. Number three, character redesign again. Now this is much different than when I spoke about this previously in the season two video. This is a serious departure from the actual style of the show. Now this happens in the last couple episodes that are part of the season five run of the series on the platform. You see a distinct change in how the main characters are drawn. Their features become much softer, much more round. There isn't as much of details. Like for example, hair is drawn in much more broad kind of brush strokes rather than the really segmented way that it had been done previously. This is most noticeable on Storm and Rogue who are highly featured in these last couple episodes and it's very weird that they would suddenly make such a strong change to the style of the show. Now my theory on this is probably because these were the last couple episodes added on after everything else and the show was coming to an end, especially with graduation day they needed to sum up and book in the series and so they just kind of quickly threw something together. Perhaps they didn't go through their normal, excuse me, animation studio so that's some of the differences that we see here but it just is really jarring to see such a sudden transition in the art style of the show that has been very prevalent the entire way through. Number two, more bad time travel. I am not a fan of all these time travel episodes. They really are kind of not great. I believe I've mentioned this before actually. They're just kind of like a go-to little plot that I just really don't get a lot of enjoyment out of and I really find that the one at the beginning of the season is just the pinnacle of the worst of it. I don't like how it works. I don't like how everything is forced again. We see both 
groups here. They're both trying to fight to change a little aspect and all that. It's just, I'm tired of it. I want something new and something different. And we've already seen this plot twice in the series. I really don't want to see it again. And if this series continued on, I hope that there was no plan to keep shoving this time travel idea down our throats. Because it just really is a shame that they are just keep kind of going back to it almost as if it's a crutch of a plot point for the series. Number one, love in vain. I really did not like this story either. Um, it had a lot of issues for me. It was really kind of weird and strange and didn't have a lot of logical sense to it. And I think this is because it really didn't dive into what was going on just before this episode launched into it. For example, we really don't know how Cody came across the aliens um, when he was injected or all that stuff, how he was convinced, or is this even Cody, or, and is it just a plant from the aliens, or all that stuff. I just really didn't like it. It was weird. It really didn't explain why all of a sudden Rogue lost her powers when transitioning into it, and why it was so instantaneous that she could kiss and touch Cody. None of that stuff was really explored in a way that made sense. And to make it even worse for this episode, there's a second episode in this season that deals with a parasite coming from outer space, and that is the phalanx, which I think was a much better story, which just kind of hurt this one even more. And it's such a shame because I think there was something really cool to potentially explore here with the idea of potentially Rogue being able to interact physically with other people. Um, and it's something that has been explored in other versions of the X-Men, and it has been explored in the comics. So it would have been nice to see that explored but in a much better story that made a lot more sense and was a lot more enjoyable, unlike this episode. Now, that does it for my negatives and all the things I did not like about this season, so let's jump into what I liked with my top five favorites. Starting off with number five, improved animation. This is much different from what I kind of mentioned in my negatives. I did not find those last two episodes to be an improvement. What we did see, especially throughout season four, is that they must have been finding ways to adapt the artistic style in with the new technology and processes available to animation. We saw backgrounds become much nicer, the colors became much more vibrant and um, well developed and more vivid, and then also we saw a cleaning up of the actual animation movements, so characters moved much cleaner. There was a lot more movements that were available to the characters and stuff like that that were not previously available due to the restrictive animation style. So I really like to see that improvement happening. It would have been very interesting to see if this series continued into more seasons, how that would have continued to improve, and I hope those improvements would not have included the sudden character changes that we saw in those last two episodes that I mentioned in my negatives, but I did like the overall appearance of the artistic style throughout season four in the short first few episodes of season five. Number four, a happy and conclusive ending. With the series cut short, they did kind of have to throw something together, I feel like, because there are so many unresolved issues throughout the series, and Graduation Day didn't really kind of sum them all up, but it did give a nice bookend to the series. I felt that was really quite rewarding for us as a viewer and made a lot of logical sense, if you look at it this way, at least. So the series starts off with the Sentinels and the X-Men being forced into the public eye, finally, against necessarily Xavier's best wishes. He even says at the very beginning that this was not how he wished them to be introduced to the world. And here we find Xavier having to say goodbye. He has finally succumbed to his ongoing adventures with the X-Men and the overexertion of his powers, and his body is dwindling away. The team tries all the tricks they can to try to save them, even calling forth Magneto to try to keep him together. However, ultimately they must contact Lalandra and the Shi'ar to bring their more advanced medicine to save him, which they are able to do so. However, the only backside of that is that Xavier must go with the Shi'ar to maintain that level of care to continue living on. So basically, this series is the story of the X-Men and their adventures under the leadership of Xavier in the public eye. So yes, there is previous X-Men, but they were working in the shadows and were not public. And the X-Men will continue to potentially resolve some of those issues that I feel are still lingering in the air and never resolved. However, that will be without Xavier. So that really kind of segmented this section of the storyline of the X-Men into a really nice way that makes sense as to why the story ends here, but there's still more to tell. I really liked how they do it, did all that with the exception of how they changed the character's design, but that being said, I think there was a lot of worse ways they could have potentially just ended the series very suddenly, and I'm happy that they gave it a really nice closure that it makes sense and gives us a really nice happy ending for the characters at this point in their life.
Number three, the better parasite. I, of course, talked about the alien lizard insect things that tried to incorporate the X-Men into their colony, and I did not enjoy that. And I mentioned that it was because partially there was a much better parasite from outer space involved in the season, and that was the phalanx. And I thought that was a very interesting and cool two-episode storyline. How we were introduced to them, how it all made sense, and the fact that we actually teamed up with some of them to battle the greater collective to stop them and prevent the entire world succumbing to the collective. I really liked how it was all done. I really enjoyed the story. I thought it had a lot of great humor to it from Wizard, the member of the Phalanx, and his mission to save his lover. I really thought that there's a lot to this that could be explored even more, like what is it like on their world, how is he successful, and I would love to have seen more of this so much so, but I do think that this segment of the story was really well done. Again, here we see when stories are allowed multiple episodes and explored more in depth, I really enjoy them a lot more because we're allowed to get better storytelling out of that. I really think all these segmented one-off episodes, not all of them, but most of them really do suffer from the fact that they don't dive into the story enough and they're just kind of left with, oh, I kind of wish I had more there. It doesn't really make sense with everything else, which this was not one of those cases. Number two, improved use of time travel. Now, I already mentioned this list early on, kind of like how I did with the previous couple facts, that I didn't like how the time travel was used early on in the season. But when we come back around to it in the battle in the nexus of time, I really enjoyed how time travel was used here. It wasn't necessarily the main focus of the plot, it was just kind of a device that helped along the plot, and really wasn't focusing on jumping back and forth to save a single aspect in time that will better the future for the people there and all that stuff. I liked how they used it, and it was a more complex use of the idea of time travel, and we got to explore it much more in a different way, which I also feel is what I didn't like about that. As I said, it's kind of the same recipe over and over again. Here we see a complete mix-up of how time travel is used. I really enjoy this. I like how we brought together several psychics from not only here on Earth and not our regular X-Men, but potentially other series as well. There are several of them in the background. Uh, I'd be very interested if you were able to recognize many of them. Let me know down in the comments which ones you recognized from this storyline here that were captured by Apocalypse and the other villains of the series. Uh, I really also enjoyed that aspect of the storyline, how the bad guys all came together and teamed up. This really seemed like a big kind of culmination um, storyline here with so many of the villains coming together to work together to take down the X-Men who have defeated them separately, which I like that aspect of it as well. Um, so I just, all together, this was a really cool storyline and I liked this sudden change in how time travel was used so much. Number one, Captain America. Now, here again, we have another team up which I really enjoy and a crossover to the greater Marvel world. In the short season of season five in the episode we get a crossover where we see Wolverine dealing with his past once again and a memory of a mission with Captain America where the two of them team up to take down Red Skull and I just enjoyed this so much what's really great about this time and the X-Men animated series we're really seeing Marvel Entertainment first kind of dabbling in the idea of expanding a multiverse of entertainment platforms on the cartoons. At the same time, we had the Spider-Man cartoon, we had the Fantastic Four cartoon, and all those were kind of playing into one another and having crossovers amongst each other. Now, this is the only one we really get in the X-Men series, but we saw several crossovers into the Spider-Man animated series and into the Fantastic Four animated series, where X-Men would appear in both of those shows. And I really liked that they were kind of dabbling at this and really kind of setting the groundwork to probably a lot of the techniques they use later on in the present day when they introduced this idea of interlocking stories and franchises to create what we know now as the MCU. So it's just a kind of a fun look back at the early days of this idea, taking the interwoven world of the comics into a different platform, and then we see it today in live action film. Plus, on top of that, the episode is just really cool and a nice departure from everything else that we've seen in the X-Men series. With that being said, though, that finishes my list, and I finishes this series on 5 and 5 of the X-Men animated series that ran from 1992 to 1997. Overall, I love re-watching this series despite any negatives I mentioned throughout it. The nostalgia is 100% there for me. I grew up on this cartoon. It's what introduced me to Marvel and X-Men and 
gave me my first love for everything that they do. And nothing they could do could probably ruin it for me. Now, I don't have any other videos currently in the works regarding the series, but I'm sure there will be more. So if you enjoyed this series, definitely let me know, and I will work on some more content focusing on it. I have a couple ideas, but I just have to figure out how I want to do them. That being said, though, I hope you subscribe and set the alerts to get all my future content regarding other aspects of the MCU. I've already decided on my next series I'm going to tackle. It's going to be a while because I'm tackling the Netflix Daredevil series. Um, I'm going to be doing a series of five and five and content regarding that. But I have other videos planned as well. So, like I said, subscribe, set those alerts to get all those videos. And of course, if you enjoy this, make sure to give it a like. I really appreciate it. And likes help other people find my channel and my videos. That being said, though, I hope you all are having a marvelous day. Bye, friend.